So if we look at, at the kind of the, just the incidence of diabetes, now this is becoming more and more, I won't say popular, I'll just say prevalent in the US, and this is really globally across the world in industrialized countries, we're seeing these same types of trends. But you can see here 26.9 million Americans have been diagnosed with diabetes. Now let's get clarity. This is type two diabetes okay that we're referring to we're not talking about here um, type 1 diabetes or, or latent adult autoimmune diabetes we're talking about type 2 adult onset diabetes 26.9 million that's approximately 8.2 percent of the population and this is coming directly from the national diabetes statistics report published in 2020 so this is relatively new information based upon this year now we know like it, for example in schools Today, a lot, we're seeing a lot more children develop diabetes. As a matter of fact, there is a symptom that nurses are taught to look for in children in grade school. This symptom is called acanthosis nigricans, which um, what that is, it's a Latin term that means dark or blackness in the neck. And so what happens is in the fold of the neck, right, right in the fold of the neck when you bend your neck backward, that skin becomes very rough and very dark, almost like an ashen or gray, and in some cases, depending on your skin tone, almost black in color. And so if you, if you see this in your children, this dark swath on the back of the neck, definitely is something you wanna do is get them into the doctor and have that looked at and have them tested for diabetes because you don't wanna let a blood sugar issue uh, get too deeply entrenched or too deeply enrooted because it can create a lot of problems. Now there are different types of diabetes and I think it, it bears its bearing worth mentioning. Um, there's, there's what most of us are familiar with which is type 2 diabetes. This is oftentimes referred to as adult onset. Let's change our color here. There we go adult onset diabetes and then there's type 2 diabetes which is generally in younger individuals this is oftentimes was called juvenile diabetes um, but but most formally type 1 diabetes and, and then there's another form, and this is autoimmune disease here. So type one is an autoimmune attack on the pancreas beta cells, whereas adult onset um, is, is different in its mechanism. And then we have uh, what's oftentimes referred to, it's not on here, but we have what's sometimes referred to as LADA, uh, latent adult uh, diabetes, autoimmune diabetes. And so this kind of really, in my opinion, really falls more under the type one diabetes, although some people call this diabetes 1.5 and so um, again my personal opinion and professional opinion is that there's not much of a difference here other than the age at onset they're pretty much the same condition the same mechanisms of action underlying we'll talk about that shortly and then there's also what now is being called diabetes type 3 so type 3 diabetes or Alzheimer's you know you know, a lot, a lot of folks don't realize that Alzheimer's disease or dementia is now in the research, in the literature, is actually being shown to be, a, in, in many people, a blood sugar problem. So think of, whereas diabetes, type 2 adult onset diabetes, is something that predominantly is insulin resistance. This is insulin resistance to the brain itself, and so we, we have memory or or uh, dementia type issues that can to begin to develop. And then there's gestational diabetes, which is the diabetes of pregnancy, uh, which is largely the same thing as adult onset diabetes. It's just that this occurs rapidly in pregnancy for the same reasons that we might see type two diabetes develop. So we'll talk, let's talk a little bit about some of these differences. So let me move that arrow out of the way. So with type two diabetes, you've got food that contains glucose or it's converted the, the food substrates are converted into glucose and then that sends a message to the pancreas when that glucose gets into your bloodstream and the pancreas will produce insulin and that insulin then will open the cells think of insulin as a key if you will it's a key 
that opens this special door on the surface of our cells, including our muscle cells. And that, when that key unlocks that door, glucose, as you can see here in this little blood vessel, glucose comes into the cell and it helps that cell generate energy so that it can do what it's supposed to do. So in this case of muscle cell, it's supposed to contract or relax and it needs lots of energy to do that. And glucose is one of the energy substrates that helps that happen. What happens in type 2 diabetes though, is over time, people become resistant to insulin. So their key starts to change. And if you've ever had um, like a key that didn't work quite as well, you put it in the keyhole and it won't quite open the door and you have to jiggle it a little bit to get that door to unlock. This is kind of like insulin resistance uh, because the insulin, the key of insulin doesn't work quite as well. So you have to jiggle it a little bit molecularly speaking. And so it makes it less efficient for this process to occur. And we're going to map this out in detail here shortly. And we're going to talk about all the nutrients that play a role in this. So stick with me, but I want you to understand the concept insulin resistance is it generally occurs as a result of either abuse to the body of the wrong food, not adequate exercise, malnourishment, or inflammation, chronic inflammation. So we'll dive into that here in just a minute. Those are, and by the way, those are all, it's what we call di type two diabetes, a lifestyle choice. I know many of you are getting mad at me right now. I can just see your head steaming as you're sitting and watching. How is type two diabetes a choice, Dr. Osborne? It's a choice because you can change your food, you can choose to exercise, you can choose to get the right nutrients in your diet, and you can choose better behaviors that create less inflammation. And so in that regard, it largely is a choice. Whereas type one diabetes, less of a choice, this is more of an autoimmune condition, not more of an autoimmune condition, it is an autoimmune condition. And so what happens here is your, your pancreas starts to become damaged. You actually produce antibodies against the beta cells in the pancreas and the beta cells in your pancreas produce insulin. And so when your pancreas is damaged, it produces little to no insulin. And so that sugar, you still have it. That sugar is still in your bloodstream, but it doesn't have a great way to get into the muscle cell. It's blocked because there's not enough insulin. So there's no key to open the door of your cells to allow glucose to leave your blood and go into your cells to make energy. So the glucose gets trapped in the blood. And this is why with type one diabetes, people are insulin dependent, oftentimes have to go on insulin as a medication. And so we see the same thing in, in LADA or in, in uh, diabetes 1.5. Um, again, it's a, it's a latent adult onset autoimmune diabetes, whereas this type one is classically considered happening in kids, younger children. But again, the same premise and that this is an autoimmune condition. Now there's some research that shows that gluten can speed this one up. Gluten can actually increase the risk for developing type one diabetes. And there's really some good research on pregnant women who are gluten free, their children have much less risk of developing type one diabetes than women who eat gluten during pregnancy. And I'll show you that here in just a minute, but I think it's worth mentioning. And then over here we have gestational diabetes. And I'll point a few things out. Gestational diabetes, as I mentioned a minute ago, is very much the same type of process here as type two diabetes. And, and the danger with the gestational diabetes is the baby, because of the extra sugar, the baby can get too big, okay? And when the baby gets too big, it can create pregnancy complications um, through birth, right? If that baby gets too large. A lot of times when women go to their OB-GYN and they're having their regular checkups, um, the doctor wants to do a what's called a GTT, a glucose tolerance test. And that test is where they give you this sugar water to drink and then they collect your blood for several hours after you drink that and they're measuring your blood sugar. And this is one of the tests that they, that they try to use to, to to help you understand whether or not you have gestational diabetes. Again, this is just a, a, an opinion. Um, don't, don't construe this as medical advice. My opinion, this test is worthless because whether you do or whether you don't have gestational diabetes, ultimately you should be eating premiumly well during pregnancy. So you shouldn't need a test to tell you to eat better, to take care of your baby. So if you wanna avoid diabetes during pregnancy, Again, you shouldn't be eating that way even when you're not pregnant. That's just my opinion. But eating inflammatory, high sugar foods, 
um, lack of activity even during pregnancy. A lot of times we want to handle pregnant women with, with like this dainty um, attitude where because you're pregnant, you shouldn't walk, you shouldn't do things, you shouldn't stand for too long a period of time. And my advice is that pregnant women should stay as active as their body allows them to stay during pregnancy and not lean on everyone else. And that, again, this is no accusation to any of you in particular, but I see it a lot where doctors tell pregnant women to take it easy and husbands tell pregnant wives to take it easy. And the reality is, is just because a woman is pregnant, she doesn't necessarily need to take it more easy. Now, should she go and try to do heavy weights and heavy deadlifts and things of that nature? No, but she should live and try to live regularly because a lot of times that gestational diabetes it comes in as a result of inactivity or as a result of less activity. So that we remember part of how we control blood sugar is muscle, right? And one of the things that causes us to lose muscle mass is inactivity. So if you're being inactive during that pregnancy, your muscles are actually starting to shrink and your, your blood sugar can actually go up. And if that's what doctors are trying to call gestational diabetes after they've told you to take it easy, you can see where the advice could get a woman into trouble. So again, if you're pregnant, doesn't mean you necessarily need to take it easy and lie in bed or lie around trying to protect you know, the delicateness of the baby. The baby inside of you that's growing is gonna be just fine if you try to stay active during your pregnancy. Um, so, so again, um, be careful around that because you could actually, through inaction and through inactivity, you could actually cause some major issues. Hey, don't forget to check out the rest of the series right here. Make sure you hit subscribe below. And as always, thanks for tuning in.